Welcome to the Empire of Garnacha, a national tasting talk experience on the brands of Mondovino produced by the Wine Education Department. After this presentation, you should be able to describe how the grapes and techniques used influence the focus wines, describe the styles of the focus wines, and identify the accounts in your territory who can and should sell these focus wines and figure out a way to introduce them to them. Reminder, we've got a little bit of a change here because we're coming into this uh, at the end of the fiscal year. You're going to prove that you have participated in this through a SurveyMonkey evaluation link which will be emailed to you. It will be titled as such on the screen, NTT Empire of Garnacha FY19 Evaluation. Once you have gone through this presentation and taken the survey, you, I will get an email that you've done it and I will send you an email that confirms it and you save that for your records. It's a little different because we are not using BrainShark for this evaluation. The Wine Education Department, we have uh, a why that we uh, try to live through every day. We inspire, we equip, and we empower. Mondovino is a fantastic brand uh, internationally now, and uh, we should embark on our voyage where Heritage meets innovation and sell Mondovino as, a, as the great brand that it is. As we mentioned, this is the Empire of Garnacha, and the Empire of Garnacha starts with Campo de Borja, uh, a DO in the uh, Aragon district of Spain. It is sandwiched between the uh, Ebro River in the north, and to the south of the region is the La Huicha River. Uh, it has a border to the Navarra region to its northeast and has everything from uh, 350 meters of elevation all the way up to 700. It's a fairly diverse um, elevation which is really awesome um, and gives you a lot of different places to grow grapes. It is part of a region that really had its origins as far back as 5 BC when the Celtiberians, a tribe uh, mixed between Iberian and Celtic tribes uh, settled the area and then as uh, the Roman conquest came through Spain that fortified the area as a place to grow grapes and make wine and then that uh, gave rise to the Borgia family um, most notably from Italy but they originated in Borja and they were a family that produced two of the popes for the Catholic Church through history. The region is basically named after them and campo simply means field or land, so Campo de Borja. It received its DO fairly recently in 1980, so this is uh, a region that has very old origins, uh, but a very modern look on what's going on uh, because of its recent rise to the idea of top quality Spanish wine. And there you see it on the map, uh, not far from the town of Saragossa, which is uh, to the southeast, and then you see uh, to the north, touching it, is uh, Navarra. Not far away, to the northwest, you'll find La Rioja Baja. And to the south, the formal regions of uh, Carnena and Calatayud. All of these areas, Carnena, Calatayud, and Campo de Borja, are all part of the greater region of Aragon. And all of these regions, absolutely wonderful for growing Garnacha and Garnacha was most likely created right here in this area. When you look at the general layout of Campo de Borja and some history, we, we as mentioned, the ancient Romans play a part as they do throughout most of Europe. The Cistercian Monastery of Veruela has a huge play in this. It was the center of great production for many centuries. Uh, it continued to expand its power throughout its uh, life and existence to the point that uh, it even bought an entire town um, once upon a time, which is still part of the winemaking uh, region itself. So the oldest vineyards in the DO date back to 1145, which is a pretty long history. And uh, the, the Cistercian Monastery of Veruela actually bought the town of Ainson, and uh, that is still part of the wine production to this day. Uh, as mentioned before, it's relatively new in its modern wine region approach. That actually is a good thing because it uh, hasn't settled it into a stiff uh, trajectory of tradition and in rather is still uh, innovating as we go. 
there is a transition going on here because as the uh, the Cistercian monastery div uh, domination gave way to individual farmers and uh, production in that regard, the, pr the farmers were not wealthy enough to have their own wineries, so they formed co-ops, and co-ops dominated the landscape of Campo de Borja for quite some time. And they predominantly made large quantities of wine that not necessarily were centered on being the top quality. And now what's happening is the natural tendency of the region to be able to produce great wines is moving it from its history of co-op production into a future of individuality and high quality. So let's talk about the Baja region, which is the lowest elevation, thus the name, 350 to 400 meters above sea level. Garnacha matures very early and easy here because it is quite warm based on the idea of lower elevation and just a warmer continental climate to begin with. The great blessing of soil here is that it has calcareous content, which has the ability to drive the pH back down. In other words, raises the level of total acidity, even in a region that's very warm and, and makes wines very powerful and aromatic. The medio area is exactly what medio means, the middle. It is uh, centered between 450 and 550 meters above sea level, and this is the main area for production. It has a different soil type. It's a little more stony, a little bit more red um, clay kind of, kind of inclusion. Uh, it has the largest concentration of vineyards, and most assuredly, the wines here are complex, structured, and fleshy. It has that nice balance between being warm, but also having some elevation. Um, and this is the uh, favorite area, traditionally, because it made the um, most successful wines. Now, as we move into the Alta area, it's roughly between 550 and 700 meters above sea level. So 700 meters translates to 2,300 feet. Uh, that's a significant change in elevation. And the other thing that happens here is as you're going up further towards the peaks, uh, soil depth continues to drop because of erosion pushing it toward the valley floor. So in the Baja, the soil's fairly deep. In the Medio, it's still pretty deep, but it's got uh, the larger uh, rocks and things like that that have um, degraded out of the higher elevations but not been washed all the way to the valley. And now we get into the higher elevations where the soil is very thin, it's very stony. We're going to see a picture of it here in just a moment. The wines up here can be more elegant, they can be more subtle. Uh, the change in elevation reduces temperature and allows the Grenache to be a little more uh, tart strawberry and less um, ripe and jammy. Alright, so here's a picture of the soils as, as mentioned before. So in the Baja area, you see that down on the bottom right, you have those calcareous brown soils where it's still really well drained, but because there's a little uh, calcareous material in there that absorbs water and holds it, that's great, and also drives pH down. On the, on the left, we see the clay ferrous sort of iron clay um, combination that is typical for the Medio area. Notice how the rocks are fairly large. You're gonna get some drainage and some water retention, which is really awesome combination for that area and the wines reflect it. They're, they're, they're very balanced, they're very rich. Up in the right, you see what it's like up in the Alta area. Stony, fractured, very shallow, not a whole lot of dirt to deal with, a lot of stones. Certainly an area where it's natural for vines or maybe olive trees to grow, but not much in the way of traditional food crops. So now we're moving into Navarra. Navarra has La Rioja on the Navarra western border. To the north, it borders France in the Pyrenees. And to the south, we already saw that it comes into contact with Campo de Borja. Navarra also uses a large proportion of Garnacha in its um, vineyards, along with a lot of international varieties. Navarra has been the most sort of um, mixed of the vineyard sources for a very long time. It was where one of the largest uh, analogy research stations has lived for a very long time and one of the most advanced so that it was pushing the envelope and, and trying other varietals in the area as part of their studies. But the vineyards were already mixed based on Navarra's history of being close to Bordeaux as far as the trade routes were concerned and how the Bordelais winemakers came into Spain when Phylloxera destroyed their regions and so Navarra and areas along the Pyrenees were the first ones affected by the Bordeaux mindset of winemaking, barrel aging, etc. and also the 
grape varieties that they brought with them as they moved. The predominant climate here is Mediterranean, but I if you're to the northwest of the Navarra regions, you will have some influence off the Bay of Biscay, and it becomes sort of slightly maritime. And as you go further south, it becomes even more continental and very warm. Uh, it's very diverse uh, topography, and you should expect to see a lot of different kinds of things. Um, the vineyards are everywhere from hillsides to, to flat valleys. And here we find it on the map, just to give you an idea. Um, look up there to the north and west of the region of Navarra, and you'll see where it's easily affected by the Bay of Biscay. And then obviously as you look down and it's sandwiched in between uh, Campo Borja and uh, La Rioja, specifically Rioja Baja, you uh, see why it would be warm and continental there, even though you have the Ebro River as at least, if you're right next to it, a sense of cooling and warming depending on the season. So the subregions of Navarra are Tierra Estela to the far west. That is the one that is most affected by the Bay of Biscay. Then you have Val de Sarbe, which is there in that center north. And then you have Baja Montaña, which is on the far east, but still up close to the mountains. And then you have Ribera Alta, which is right there in the middle and the largest region. And then down south, uh, sandwiched between La Rioja and Campo de Borja is Ribera Baja. So Tierra Estela has a fair amount of uh, Tempranillo. It's the main grape there, but it makes sense because it's really close to Rioja Alta. It's, it's uh, influenced by the Bay of Biscay, a really good place for Tempranillo. Val de Sarbe is in the Pamplona Basin, which we all know Pamplona because of the sun also rises and the running of the bulls and all of that kind of stuff. But there, the, um, the subregion runs along the Arga River and it's on gentle rolling hills. And again, you still have a similar climate to Estela, but a little more garnacha planted here alongside of the Tempranillo. Baja Montaña is in the eastern part. It borders Aragon. It has a lot of the uh, Pyrenees influence. And here you see about 60% of the vineyards are planted to garnacha. The rest would be mostly Tempranillo at 25%. Ribera Alta is flatter and hotter. It's more easily um, used for vineyard land just because it's not as rough terrain. And you see a lot of uh, Graziano, interestingly enough, alongside of Tempranillo. But you also see international varietals here. And Ribaja, Ribera Baja in the southern part between Ebro, Ergon, and La Rioja, there you'll see it's mostly a flat plain. It's dominated by the Sierra del Moncayo. And you see Tempranillo going first and Garnacha going second as far as plantings are concerned. Each subregion has its own fairly unique soils. Uh, when you're up in Tierra Estela, it's a mix ranging from deep heavy clay to marlin sand, loamy gravelly soils on the valley floor. In other words, your, your soil is based on whether you're up in the elevation where erosion's taken soil away or whether you're down in the, in the valley where it's deposited it. In Val de Sarbe, uh, you're going to see a similar kind of thing where you have heavy textured gray marl down in lower elevation and then some sand and alluvial soils near any kind of water soils. Um, the soils of Baja Montaña are very similar to Val de Sarbe. You're going to see a lot of round gravel, a lot of excellent drainage here, um, especially in the alluvial terraces of the two, two main rivers. The Ribera Alta has a similar soil to all of them except that marl and sand with some more limestone here, so you get that beautiful uh, pH drive uh, for, for your slightly more refreshing wines. And then Ribera Baja is, is a lot of um, deposition soil, so deep loam soils with a lot of stones for drainage. There are some limestone subsoils in this area which can help, but they're not necessarily right in, in the heart of where the vines are sitting. So now we should move on to Garnacha. This is a very old variety. Um, it's gone to grow on several mutations like Garnacha Blanca and Garnacha Gris. Uh, there's also um, a few, there's one iteration that even has um, darkly colored flesh instead of the traditional vinifera style. It most likely orig originated right there in Aragon uh, in northeast Spain, and so uh, would have been planted very soon after in Campo de Borja. 
it has traveled from this area to the rest of the world. So I tend to call it Garnacha by choice, even though the French made it more famous in Southern Rhone and called it Grenache. Uh, it has potentially very high sugar levels in the berries. It, it ripens fairly easily, it drops acidity fairly quickly, and so it is not known for being a delicate wine, but rather a wine that has bright fruits, rich um, ripeness, as well as a, a certain amount of power. Um, it's best pruned short and trained close to the ground. That's why bush vines are very common for this particular plant in both Spain as well as when you see it other places like uh, the Rhone Valley. In places like, like um, Rioja, it acts sort of like Merlot does for Cabernet Sauvignon. So Tempranillo becomes the grape of structure and elegance and Garnacha comes and plays the fill-in role where it puts flesh on the bones. Um, but it is capable in the right places of being a great and noble front runner instead of a blending grape. Behold the noble grapes. Yeah, the, we, we know these, right? The Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot. These are the noble grapes as decided by who is the question. You know, the noble grapes were mostly decided by wine writers in mostly British wine houses and their sort of myopic scene of just Bordeaux and Burgundy with a few others. I would say that without a doubt that Garnacha is a noble grape. And the reason I would say that is that it has the following characters. Um, it has the ability to make ageable wines. It has the ability to make complicated wines. It has um, both the ability to blend into other grapes as well as stand on its own. And we certainly cannot argue with the quality and longevity of the wines that are centered on it in Southern Rhone. And we can see these potential wines also in Spain. Look at what we're doing now in Priorat, where the major variety is Garnacha. And we're making wines that have stunned the world with complexity and power. And there's no reason that that can't be done right there in Campo de Borja and its surrounding areas. This is what makes it quality. Quality, balance, intensity of flavor, complexity, length of finish, and the ability to express terroir while it improves with age. And so Garnacha is more than capable of doing all of these things. It can have a very long finish. It can express its terroir. It can improve with age. It can be both complex and then often you can be cheerful and simple. But just one example of a wine that's made simply does not take away its nobility. It is certainly one of the grapes we should pay a lot more attention to than we do. All right, it's time to talk about the wines and the wineries now that we have some information about the regions. First winery we're going to talk about is Borsal. Bodegas Borsal is um, a fantastic winery in the Campo de Borja region. Uh, it starts off as uh, a co-op where they are bringing in wines from lots of different producers and leveraging all of their talents and skills. And that was in 1958. It was called the Cooperative of Borja. Some years later it combined the cooperatives of Pozuelo and Tabuenca and became in 2001 they changed their name to Bodegas Borsal and established as a limited company with its 700 members uh, became shareholders and the management team was appointed to take them to the next level which they most certainly have done. The first wine we're going to explore from them is actually the uh, Borsal Garnacha Rosé. So you have the characteristics of the vineyard being like 10 to 25 year old vines just to make rosé. That's a good plan. I like that. Soils are stony with clay and limestone. And uh, you're doing a, a cold maceration, cryo maceration for 6 to 12 hours and then bleeding off from the skins to get this beautiful rosé color and uh, a flavor profile that's both bright strawberry and very refreshing. So take a taste of this. Talk amongst yourselves as exactly what you think would be great targets for this wine because I think that they are great and, and broad because of the, the, the love of, of pink wine dry rosés in America today is extensive. So hit pause and um, go through your tasting and then pick up where I come with, uh, with the next wine. So wine number two, 
We're still with Bodegas Borsao and now with their straight varietally labeled Garnacha. There's a little bit of Tempranillo in the blend, but it's primarily Garnacha. Again, we're still with these 15 to 25 year old vines in the stony and clay and limestone soils. Um, careful ma um, winemaking technique to extract fruit without too much harshness, but not leaving it void of, of structure. The wine has the structure for the table where you can place it with really lovely uh, meals that range from grilled meats in, even into vegetables. One of the beautiful things about uh, Garnacha is how flexible it is on the dining room table. So have a taste of this wine, figure out where you think it should go in the market, uh, press pause while you talk, and then we'll move on to the next property. Our next property is uh, a discussion of Castillo Monjardin from Nevada. So Castillo Monjardin has a long-standing history. It's located in the northwest of Nevada in the foothills of the Pyrenees. It's been a castle of importance since the 12th century under King Sancho Garces and has been part of the uh, pilgrimage route to the uh, Santiago de uh, Compostela. It, they grow Bordeaux varietals, which is not unusual that close to the Pyrenees, you're almost in France, and they also grow Garnacha and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, a very diverse set of wines from these producers. And by the way, the, and they're all quite delightful. We're gonna focus on the Garnacha uh, when we get to the wine. During the last 25 years, they've been awarded a ton of medals. And one of the things that affects them the most is uh, a, a north wind called El Cierto. Uh, it is a, uh, a very cold and can be very harsh wind. So it drives their temperatures down and makes them a much cooler climate than you think they might be otherwise. So let's talk about their first wine, which is the Garnacha La Cantera. Uh, 20 acres, these are bush trained vines. They have limestone and clay soils, which again helps uh, pop the brightness of the wine. They're at an elevation of over 1400 feet. So this definitely makes a difference in the style of the wine. You should expect this wine to be brighter and fresher and a little, um, I don't know, more fresh strawberry and less dried or cooked strawberry. Stainless steel, a little bit of old French barrels, you know, to uh, season it up and out to the market it goes. Another great crowd pleaser, uh, really wonderful with food as almost all Garnacha is. Uh, so have a taste of it, talk about how you can put this into your marketplace and then uh, and while you have us on pause. Wine number four, we're going back to Bodegas Borsal and we're going to pick up their Tres Picos. Um, this is uh, from that six to seven hundred meters of altitude up in the um, foothills of, of Moncayo, um, 35 to 60 year old vines. Tres Picos is powerful and elegant. This has been a, a huge success from this winery for oh, at least 15 or 16 years, maybe even longer than that. I'm trying to remember when I first put it on a wine list by the glass. I worked in northern Michigan before. Uh, that was probably probably 2003. So it's, uh, at least that long ago, it was already well suited to its success that it's continuing today. And you do see a little French oak here, which is not always normal for Garnacha, but we know the Spaniards love to put wine in oak. It's really well tempered here. It's really the Garnacha that pops up, not so much the oak. So give it a taste, talk about how many places this would apply, and then take us off pause for the next wine. So now we're moving on to the, the Pride and Joy wines. Um, Bodegas Borsal also runs Alto Moncayo, which is their luxury brand. It is designed to be exactly that, the hopeful ex expression of excellence for their appellation. It was founded in 2002. It wants to be a world reference point for Garnacha in the Spanish style. They have 92 hectares and they're all in the Moncayo foothills up in that 500 meters and above elevation range. They have three wines, the Aquilon, the Alto Moncayo, and the Veraton. So the first one is Alto Moncayo. It's 100% Garnacha. It's 300 to, or 30 to 50 year old vines. They ferment it in stainless steel and then they move it to new American and French oak barrels. And this is the Veraton. Uh, so the Veraton is the wine we're tasting now. And when you taste this, note how large, round, powerful, and expressive this wine is. In America today, there are 
so many customers that are looking for this rich, velvety intensity in red wine. I think you'll find plenty of homes for it. Discuss it after you hit pause, and then we'll move on to the next wine. Wine number six is the Jewel of the Crown, the Aquilon, 100% Garnacha, 60 to 100 year old vines. It spends 24 months in new French and American oak after being fermented in stainless steel. It is powerful, velvety texture in the mouth, uh, really dark color, especially when you consider that Garnacha is not known for color. So they have obviously um, done low yields and, um, and, and this is an expression of extraction in a way that really suits the steakhouse and the person who loves um, rich Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, this is a wine for them. Someone who loves Priorat wines, this is a wine for them. And it fits into the same price range as those kind of things as well, so it's not like you're talking to a different pocketbook than you would be ordinarily. So give a taste of this, take a soft pause um, when you're finished, and we'll move on to our conclusions. So our key points, things you want to take away. Garnacha is a noble grape. Its home is Campo de Borja slash Aragon. There's a reason that Campo de Borja is called the Empire of Garnacha. There's so much going on there great about Garnacha. Um, you can find Garnacha, everything in that stylistic range from what we saw with Castillo Monjardin, where it's fresh and vibrant and delicious and fits into the table with almost anything you're eating, all the way up into the Aquilon, which is big and powerful and robust and very rich. And all of those are, are legitimate expressions of the grape. So it's very flexible. It definitely expresses its regional character when we find it here in Spain. Don't forget to uh, look for your email to fill out your SurveyMonkey evaluation so you can get credit for participating in this um, National Tasting Talk course. Thank you very much for your time, or should I say muchas gracias. Have a great day.